joined by the former head of the military medical school at the Curra. He's retired Commandant Cahal Berry. And uh, good morning to you, Cahal, and many thanks for uh, getting in touch with us on the programme here. You were former head of the school, responsible for coordinating all medical training for the Irish Army worldwide indeed. Uh, the medical school's primary goal we see in a bit of research we've done is to prevent our next casualty from becoming our next fatality. You were based mostly at the current camp. You served as a troop commander, staff officer, military observer and medical officer on five tours of duty overseas in the Balkans, Africa, the Middle East, working with the EU, NATO and the United Nations and six years experience in the Irish military's tri-service high performance unit and multiple courses and exchanges of international peer agencies. Very, very impressive. Cahal, good morning to you. Good morning, Clem. I'm very happy to speak to you and good morning to your listeners. And best wishes in your retirement. You're, you only retired two weeks ago. Uh, yes, um, I would say probably a temporary retirement. I, I tend to rejoin as soon as the, the situation in the Defence Force improves and um, I'd like to see some progress on that over the last 24 hours. All right. Tell me a little bit more by what you mean when the Defence Force's situation improves. Well, I mean, the issue is being in terms of service at the moment. And, um, like, if you, if you look at the, the reality of the situation, the Defence Forces soldiers are, are they're the only group of people in the entire Irish society who are actually denied minimum wage. So, I mean, that should tell you exactly um, what level of, of pay they're getting. So, we're denied the minimum wage. They have um, no recourse to the European Work Time Directive. And they're denied access to negotiate a uh, national pay talk. So... That's what our troops would describe as the real triple lock. It, it locks our personnel in poverty and it locks their, their families in poverty. And um, they're the big three issues. And if they're resolved, and they're very easy to resolve, um, you will see the situation improving dramatically. Uh, if you were a head of the military medical school at the Cora, am I correct in presuming you're a medical doctor? That's correct, yeah. Um, so I have 23 years service, probably completed. Um, I was a special force officer for six years. Um, I studied uh, medicine in the Royal College of Surgeons and then I returned and was transferred to the medical corps to use those skills from a medical perspective in, in the military. So tell me about the procedures of people. Ger began to outline them there and a listener told us yesterday in response to I asking about this level of sickness and how is that defined and whether people get paid if they go on sick leave. What is the process when people call in sick in the Defence Forces? Well, I suppose the first thing I should say is the word absenteeism was used there um, uh, both today and yesterday. I think it's quite an inflammatory and, and a misleading term. And even the term sick leave isn't actually quite accurate from a military context. The vast majority of these people, they're actually on injury leave. They've been physically injured uh, in their work. So most of the, the people who would present um, uh, on a sick parade in the morning or would be brought in by ambulance from an exercise or from an operation, they would have broken bones, they would have torn ligaments, they would have a slipped disc in their back, basically. So it's a, a physical injury after occurring. And they would only get sick leave, or what I would describe as injury leave, as if that leave would promote the recovery. And we would have a tradition in the military that if you're deployed in operations, that you are at your military best. And we don't send people out on an operation or guarding government buildings or guarding port leash prison who are on crutches or who are on slings or on casts. You would only deploy if you're at your 100% best. And if you need some time off to promote your recovery um, and as part of a, a, a rehabilitation program, that's entirely appropriate. And I think it's absolutely essential. Now, Tom rang into the programme yesterday, and thank you very much for coming, uh, agreeing to speak with us this morning. And he said, you have one of three options when you go to a medic, if you're seeking sick leave or absenteeism or whichever, and certainly wasn't using the term in any derogatory sense. He spoke about ED excused duty, LD light duty, or MD, which is medication on duty, and he says all with full pay. Um, yes, and uh, I'm very glad you mentioned that. So we actually have a, a, a stratified uh, form of injury uh, leave that you can grant. So if someone is particularly bad, if they've broken their leg, for instance, I mean, a military barracks, 120 years old, built by the British, a military barracks is no place for someone who's walking around with a full leg cast on crutches. And yes, they can go home and they can work the phone at home and they can send their emails at home. That's the appropriate place for them to promote the recovery. If someone, however, just has a sprained ankle or a sprained knee and just needs a small bit of a low 
intensity work for a week or two to promote the recovery. Then they're given LD or light duties, which means they can do all duties inside the military, except they wouldn't be expected to go on a battle physical training session, or they wouldn't be expected to go on a tactical exercise for the week or two in order to promote recovery. And if it's something very, very minor, like they come in with a chest infection, they can be just given MND, which is called medicine on duty. So they're fully uh, available for duty, except they're just given some medication to promote the recovery. So I'm very happy that you mentioned that, that there is a stratified um, level of options that a medical officer can, can give to a soldier if they're, if they're um, ill, and there are three options, and they're used appropriately, basically, as the circumstances. Uh, and I'm not for a moment disputing what you've just said, but I must ask you the question, though, that in the, in, in the context of 9,000 people in the Defence Forces, less than that, and 200 a day going sick, according to this report, and that there were 21,163 sick leave days between January 1st and April 15th this year. And those figures is our official data released to Fianna Fáil Defence Spokesperson Jack Chambers, so we're not making them up. Are you surprised at those numbers, Cahal Berry? Um, I'm actually surprised that they're not a little bit higher. And really? I'll just, uh, elaborate. That it's not 200 people going sick every day. It's 200 people who are officially regarded as being on sick leave. And this is basically a function of, like, this is with my, my former Special Forces hat on, this is a function of how tough, how intense and how robust our training is. As you know, because of the retention crisis, there's a huge amount of excessive recruitment going on in the Army at the moment and trying to fill those gaps. So for the first six months of your military career, you are absolutely dried across the coals and you're actually trained really, really hardly. And from, from a public pers- uh, uh, perspective, they should be really reassured by these statistics that only 2.4% of the military population are on sick leave at any time, despite the hardness of the, of the training. And there's a reason why we have the best peacekeepers in the world. And the reason being is when our troops deploy overseas, that they know that they've been stress tested that they know that they've been down the hard road and that they could go abroad and they realise that they have nothing left to prove. And that's why the Irish soldiers are so highly regarded overseas because they're not jumpy, because they're not, you know, easily spooked and that they're not trade happy, that they've been trained by the best and they've been trained really, really hard. And this is a classic example of that, that our people do get injured on training because it is so tough. And would you, from your medical expertise, and I'll call you Dr. Co- Commandant Dr. Cahill Berry, would you think there's any element at all in those numbers of the lack of morale, the low morale in the Defence Forces due to terms and pay and conditions, which you outlined at the start and which uh, Ger Guinan also mentioned? Is there any element of that involved in soldiers absenting themselves on sick leave or for other reasons on a daily basis? There's probably a small element of that, and morale is probably a, 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 a not a good description. I would say burnout and exhaustion is probably a far more uh, accurate description. And it's not just burnout and exhaustion for the soldiers, it's actually the impact that it's having on their families. Like, when I was a medical officer only up to uh, a couple of months ago, I was doing three full-time jobs, one in Dublin, one in the Curra, and one in Limerick. Uh, my car was completely destroyed from the amount of mileage I was doing, and I was doing those three full time jobs to cover for people who were deployed overseas or because of the vacancies uh, from understaffing. So, burnout and exhaustion is an issue. And if people are completely burned out as they come to me as a medical officer, I realise that yes, they could do it three days at home um, to, you know, uh, to rescue their relationship with their spouse. Uh, which will, will cause you know, more difficulties if that goes sour. And I think it's entirely appropriate that from a mental health perspective that people are looked after as well. And, I mean, the military population is no different from the civilian population. You, you can you can flog a soldier for, for, uh, for a week or two or a month, but this has been going on chronically now for years and is having an effect. So to answer your question, there is an element of mental illness there because people are exhausted for sure. There is a feeling of... Uh, abandonment. There is a feeling of betrayal out there that that people's patriotism and professionalism has been completely exploited. That that is uh, an issue. Um, but the main um, mental health um, problem that medical officers would encounter on a daily basis is exhaustion and burnout of their personnel. And at a personal level, is your retirement, as you described it, hopefully just temporary, is it in effect a resignation to make a point about these conditions that you have just articulated? Um, 
would be a resignation. I, I, I suppose being in, in the army, it's not massively hard, but it's incredibly frustrating because the, the reason why it's so frustrating is the problems that you've carefully articulated over the last couple of years are they're, they're completely solvable. The worst type of suffering is unnecessary suffering. And a lot of what the military is going through at the moment is completely unnecessary. And the solutions are simple. Uh, like the Department of Defence are handing back 20 million euro on average every year unspent from the defence vote. And there's a reason why 